Hello, everybody. My name is Adam Thorne and welcome to the Australian Aviation Podcast. I'm going to start today with a, I don't know if a public service announcement is the is the correct word, but certainly with a, a public announcement. If you have seen my co-host Benjamin Foster uh, recently, please get in touch. We haven't seen him for a number of weeks. We're incredibly worried about him. Uh, my other co-host, Jake Nelson, um, does join me. It's been a long time since we've seen him. We're very worried. I know his his family are worried. I spoke to his um, father the other night. He hasn't seen him either. Can you give us any kind of update as to where we think look, he may have been? We, we no. all know. We all know where he is. Adam. No, but we he, don't know for certain. Look, we don't. Let's not. It's worst case scenario, Jake. Look, it's worse. Look, no, there's don't no other say conclusions it. that can be reached that Please. he is in the clutches of the dread Enoch. Don't I'm sorry. say that. I, don't we came say in that. here. We came in here, and the screens were already on. The dread Enoch had mm. already uh, done his grim work, and. And, and set up the studio for us, and we 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 cannot we cannot help but but think that 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 he is still held holding Ben in his iron claws. The worrying thing is, is that we did lose him for a while, and then he came back with apparently no memory of what had happened in the previous few weeks. Well, he but did, now he he's did gone mention again. praying to the aviation yes. gods. So yes. I, it, it, it does <clears throat> make me fear that if the protection of the aviation gods is no longer enough to ward off the dread Enoch, mm. then perhaps nothing is, except uh, of course the orb which you can use to banish him. Yes, I have heard, however, that there could be one way, one way to placate the dread Enoch, which would be if former Qantas CEO Alan Joyce were to come on this podcast and we've been asking for him for a number of years, but do you not think that if Alan Joyce were to come on the show then perhaps the dread Enoch would release Benjamin from his grasp and... Look, it is possible. Mm. Um, we, we we cannot say for certain if, if it would be for example like an exchange kind of situation. Yes. Like a, what, so we, ex- we exchange Alan Joyce for Yes. For Ben. Yeah. I mean, Ben's not worth Alan Joyce. I mean, they can, that's not a fair swap, is it? That's He's worth a lot more than Alan Joyce. He's not. He's not. I'd lose him in a heartbeat just to have Alan Joyce on the show. This is total nonsense. I don't know where we go. This is just even you more drivel. It, I did, I did, but this is almost drivel. You this is opened more... the door. You opened the door and I just walked in. Yeah. I can't be held it's responsible drivel. for my own actions Drivel, here. drivel. Um, well, actually, in terms of in terms of shout-outs, I actually got telling off. I got telling off the other day from Sinead. Uh, you know Sinead. I know Sinead. Our production editor, sub-editor, basically the person that takes our rubbish that we write and um, makes it good. And she's like, why don't I get a shout-out on the show? So I'll give you a shout out. Sinead, you're a bloody nightmare. Stop bugging us. <laughs> she won't like that. Um, She'll be furious. We, we also had a comment uh, on, our, on our podcast last week on YouTube uh, from uh, Aviation A380 Qantas, um, who, who commented uh, the previous week. Uh, the, this person says, uh, great job, mate. Bring back the beard. Also, thanks for reading the message. Well, uh, let me address those in order. Thank you. Not yet. You're welcome. Right, okay, I didn't even follow that. Um, no, the beard, the beard is a not yet. Yeah. You're welcome. You know, that's good. Um, we do actually have a more serious shout out, which is the Australian Aviation Awards kind of informally launched a few months ago, but we've now, we, we're now formally launching it this week. So we put up some uh, new story on the website. Um, I've also re- uh, recorded, and I shouldn't say this, the, the awful video that I have to do where I like do this piece to camera and go, yeah, come on and edit the awards and stuff, which apparently shifts lots of tickets. I'm not sure if it does. Um, I did. I couldn't, I can't read the auto key very well though. So the whole thing was a bit of a disaster. So you'll see there's times where I speed up and then I slow down and I'm wearing I'm wearing a suit on the top half of me, but essentially naked from the from the trousers down. Yeah, business um, on top, party, da- party downstairs. <laughs> we, we all know the story, Adam. Yes. Yes. Anyway, but the point of the matter is if you do want to enter the Australian Aviation Awards, and you absolutely should, go to australianaviation.com.au slash Australian dash aviation dash awards. No one's going to remember that. Just go on a Google and put in Australian Aviation Awards. It'll come up. Um, we've got loads of categories for individuals and groups. Um, so go in there. You can either submit yourself or you can nominate a friend or, or, or a worthy colleague. And all that means is that they get sent an email saying that someone's nominated you just to give them a bit of a nudge. But it is actually a nice gesture if you think someone's done a good job. Um, 
The actual awards ceremony itself takes place on Thursday, the 29th of August, 2024, at the Star in Sydney. And you can go as well and buy tickets if you just want to come to the evening as well. Get involved. We had a, well, I had a, a meeting with our, um, with our head of marketing, Demi. Hello, Demi. Another shout out if you are, if you are listening. Apparently, we've already had about eight entries to the awards, even though we've not formally launched it. That's how popular they are. So get involved. The competition's already get them in. Go, go to your website, get stuff in, get um get an entry. Um, and you know, speaking of go websites, uh, just a, a, a quick plug and reminder to those of us who are looking for more, to more places for more places to find us on socials. We are on Threads and Blue Sky, in addition to Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. You can find us on Threads at Ost Aviation HQ, and uh, you can find us on Blue Sky at australianaviation.com.au. Uh, so for those of you who are exploring these bold new frontiers of these social media platforms, come home to us and find a place to rest. Basically, um, Jake just hates Elon Musk, so that's why we set these up. But if you also hate Elon that's Musk... That's not and the I don't, only reason. No, that's not the only... <laughs> if we were to give a percentage figure, though, as to how of, of what of what reason you set those up, is it 95% or higher? No, no, it's not 95%, 80 at most. <laughs> <laughs> right. We should at some point, we should just let's steam in and talk about some actual aviation news. This is why. On the Avia Australian Aviation Podcast. It's mostly nonsense, isn't it? It is mostly nonsense, but we'd have to, we have to, for, for business purposes, at least talk about a little bit about the news. And and again, I'm going to start this, uh, this week's episode, just like I started last week's, is I'm going to have to talk about a story that I actually wrote, which is rare because I try and leave 95% of the heavy lifting to Jake. But unfortunately... Um, we did actually. I did actually write um, quite a big story, and this broke on Saturday, which More... is why Adam wrote it instead of me. Exactly, exactly. It doesn't. Um, this is the story that Qantas have uh, paused Perth to London non-stop flights, and this was over fears, which were subsequently realised, of Iran's attack on Israel. Um, now, to be very clear, they have stopped the non-stop flights. They have not stopped the service, which will continue, but will stop over in Singapore. And this is because the 787, um, it is an ultra-long haul um, aircraft, but to fly from Perth to London is at the very edge of what it's capable of. And what that means is that because now it's essentially the aircraft is avoiding the Middle East, it doesn't have the range quite to fly around and make a detour. Interestingly, the return flight, the QF-10 service, won't actually have to... Um, won't actually have to stop over because of the the prevailing winds and the well, it's earth going it's jogging. going it's going downhill Adam it's going downhill yeah, it's, it's yes. a lot easier yes and we are the experts in aviation <laughs> it's going downhill right yeah this show's going downhill I know that <laughs> um but just yeah, so that won't be um but the, the 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 interesting thing about this is this has the potential to cause absolute chaos for Qantas's um plans for the European summer because they will also soon be relaunching the seasonal flights to Rome and also a brand new flight between Perth and Paris. Now, it's very unlikely they're going to can these routes entirely. They probably will put the stopover in. Um, Qantas have been quite, um, shall we say, they've, they've tried to downplay this quite a bit. Um, and they basically said, you know, we're not cancelling the route. We're not pausing the route. We're simply adding a stopover. Now, Obviously, it's not as simple as that. The entire reason they do this from Perth is the non-stop element um, to it, which effectively you uh, Qantas will charge a premium for this. It's obviously also very good for Perth as a city. Um, so this is throwing this all into disarray. We do not know yet, and it doesn't seem very likely, that people that are on this route will get any kind of compensation. So obviously, I wouldn't necessarily expect people to them to be given, you know, a huge amount back. But considering you are paying a little bit more for this nonstop flight, you know, it would probably be arguable that you should get a little bit back. We don't know if that's going to happen or not. Um, to be fair to Qantas, obviously, they, they acted very quickly to make this decision. And in fact, I think they were one of the first airlines to actually 
to step in and do this. Obviously, that was very much the correct decision. Not, you know, not including or not including, but obviously the fact that what was it two, three nights ago, you have this extraordinary attack from Iran um, onto Israel. And certainly you don't want to be in the skies over Israel, Israel while you had these drones and missiles going off. But nonetheless, this is going to create a lot of problems for Qantas and for a lot of other international airlines. Now, at the moment, um, Qantas is saying that they are temporarily adjusting the flight paths. But in all honesty, and I, I've got no insider information, I'm not, I'm not linked into um, to the security services. I find it hugely unlikely that we're going to see these flights go over Israel um, for the next, I say at least next few months, possibly to the end of the year or even longer. This, the whole situation with Iran and Israel and, and Gaza and, and all of this stuff is clearly not going to go away anytime soon. So this does present um, huge problems for Qantas. Um, what also happened at the same time is the Smart Traveller website, which is actually brilliant, I've got to say, um, kind of officially changed its advice or updated its advice. So it's now saying, as well as um, asking Australians to think twice about um, going to Israel, they've also made it clear that they believe, you know, that the airlines could stop flying there very soon, that the that, that flight paths could change. Um, and so they basically said that these, you should reconsider your need to travel. Um, so, yeah, this, this major international incident is going to have huge effects on a lot of airlines. Yeah, and uh, the flying kangaroo has said. Side note: It is odd to it, just take taking out of context. It is odd to say the flying kangaroo said something. Yeah, if in in any other context, but the Australian Aviation Podcast, that do me look, come on, you know what it do you know, in, do you mean impression of what you think a flying kangaroo would sound like? Like you haven't been thinking that. Go on. As I the only the only reference that I have is 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 Skippy, and I don't think I don't know if kangaroos actually do. A, so it's it's a uh, it's it's presumably it would be accompanied by a from wings as well. But um, <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, it's obviously I can't do those sounds at the same time because I've only got the one mouth. But in, just in any other context, saying yeah. the flying kangaroo said something would probably uh, get you some strange looks at the very least. Anyway, the flying kangaroo Qantas has said that uh, they are going to reach out to customers directly if there is any change to their booking. Um, so whether that will include um, compensation or anything like that, we we don't know. They haven't made clear, at least uh, not to my knowledge. Um, um, but it is uh, it is tricky, and this is not something that would happen if they had their their, their new A three fifty one thousand, which are exactly. coming in for Project Sunrise. Um, you know, the the, the A three fifty one thousands could could make that trip easily. Um, but the but the Dreamliners, um, you know, with, with a Dreamliner, there's there's no way to make that trip from Perth all the way up to hill all the way up the hill to London without <laughs> passing over Iranian airspace. So this actually does tie into a similar story that we were talking about. Um, it might have been just before you started, Jake, but oh, and also a little bit after you started. And this was that Air New Zealand launch flights that um, went from Sydney to I think we were starting in Sydney, went to Auckland, and then from Auckland to New York using the seven eight seven. Dreamliners. Now, the 787 Dreamliner is able to make it from Auckland all the way to New York. And Qantas it, is doing it now, too. And Qantas is doing it now, too. But it's at the very edge of what that aircraft is capable of. And Air New Zealand had lots of issues in, in early on where they thought they might have to do a stopover. And at some points, I think they actually kind of threw, not the threw the bags out of the aircraft, but had to um, stop people getting on the aircraft or stop bags being loaded on the aircraft because the heavier it is, the more that impacts its um range and if the aircraft has to change its slope path at all which aircraft do quite regularly if there's storms bad weather um political incidents like this then it has nothing in reserve basically now Qantas fixed this problem by very smartly putting less people on these flights which is why they cost a little bit more in order to make the range but nonetheless for the 787 it is an it is technically an ultra long range aircraft, but it is, I say, at the very very edge of what it's capable of. Now the shiny new A three fifty one thousands ULR. It's all the all the complainers. I do know my stuff. The new aircraft that Qantas are ordering for Project Sunrise, like Jake said, these are going to have a significantly longer range again. So they would be able to do it. Um, the criticism could be of Qantas and Air New Zealand is that they are pushing they're pushing the envelope by trying these kind of flights with this aircraft because you've got one little thing, which the detour itself clearly isn't the biggest detour, but one small detour and it's not able to do it. Yeah, it's. Um... It's it's definitely a risk, um, you know. If every if everything if everything goes smoothly, then 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 there's no problem. But uh, it's it's like you said, a, a 
too much bad weather. Obviously, it, clearly they would have factored in you know, the, the possibility that detours might be needed. Yeah. Um, but if, if the detour gets gets too big or if the, the situation gets too dire, then uh, then then they would have to to divert and stop over to refuel. Mm. Um, I, I personally can't see these um, direct flights happening probably for the rest of the year. I mean, the, the, this issue in this part of the world is not going to go away anytime soon. OK, welcome back. So we spoke a little bit before um, about the big story um, of Qantas having to change their um, their flight paths due to the uh, troubles between Iran and Israel. Um, what should we talk about next, Jake? I've got a few stories up here, but I thought, you know what? Let's let's let you pick. I, I appreciate that, Adam. Uh, well, look, let's let's talk about the very exciting subject of infrastructure. Oh, I love a bit of infrastructure. We love infrastructure. Love a bit of here. infrastructure. And, Go on. And the and the the progress on uh, Western Sydney Airport. Oh, that's my favourite infrastructure. You treat me, Jake. You treat I, it's, me. It's, it's it's. I know you too well, Adam. <laughs> um, so uh, this is. Uh, the, the, the opening of Western Sydney Airport is now less than a, th- a thousand days away. It's planned to open at the end of uh, 2026. Um, and there have been some kerfuffle with business groups um, saying that uh, the, the air cr- that the airport needs to uh, or that the government needs to scale back on the uh, what, what they're saying is the gold plated road solutions around the airport. Um, to uh, to make sure that the airport will have ground connectivity when it opens, and there's also some worries about how well the Bradfield Aerotropolis is coming along, which is going to be, be providing all these homes and businesses uh, near the airport. Um, so the Property Council of Australia, um, as reported in the Herald, has uh, called on the government to ditch uh, what it calls gold-plated road infrastructure. Um, so. Uh, they're, they're saying things like cycleways and footpaths should be scrapped. Um, Ross Grove, who is the Western Sydney director for the Property Council, says, quote, nobody is going to hop on their bicycle with 20 kilograms of luggage to ride from Fairfield to Western Sydney Airport until we have an affordable road solution. International passengers to Western Sydney will be landing on a runway surrounded by sheep paddocks and the occasional truck stop. What a smart-ass thing to say. I don't know who it is that released that statement. Oh, no one's going to be cycling with all their luggage on the back. Well, obviously not. You... Yeah, obviously that would be absurd. Um, but the thing with you know, the thing with the footpaths and the cycle paths is, as someone has pointed out on Twitter, um, I don't recall who, so if you pointed this out on Twitter and you happen to be listening to the podcast, thank you for pointing this out on Twitter. Um, but someone has, has, has pointed out, obviously nobody's going to be cycling from Fairfield um, to the Western Sydney Airport with 20 kilograms of luggage on the back of their bike, but people who live in the Bradfield Aerotropolis or people who live locally to the airport and work at the airport mm. might want to cycle or walk to work instead of having to drive or, or take the metro. You know, if you if you live and work, if you live near the airport and work at the airport, cycling or walking would be a logical thing to do. Or maybe you live near the airport and you don't work there, but you've got to get down to Melbourne for a meeting at 12 and, you know, back at five o'clock. So you're not going to be taking a, a full suitcase down to Melbourne. You're going to be taking, you know, a, a backpack at most. And also, so this this airport, um, obviously, it's going to take a long time to grow over, their, you know, over a number of decades. But the plan is eventually for it to be significantly bigger than the traditional Sydney airport. I think it, I've said some estimates it could eventually be about twice the size of it. So it just seems a little bit silly that you, you, you would, um, you know, you, you would get rid of, um, you know, vital infrastructure structure for pedestrians and for cyclists for something that's going to last 30 years because you want to rush to open it on time um because uh, now opening on time is important is important does yes need roads. it does yes but um We've also we've also got the uh, the chief executive of, of Urban Task Force uh, Property Development Lobby Group, uh, Tom Forrest, uh, was talking about the slow upgrade pro- process on Mamre Road. Mamre Road. I don't. I live here. I live in Sydney. I don't know how to pronounce the name of that road. It's disgraceful. Um, but they, they they said that the slow upgrade progress is alarming on that road. Also called for agencies to collaborate on a, a task force to basically clear bottlenecks um, on on progress on the Aerotropolis and make progress on infrastructure. Memorable quote from Mr. Forrest here. The airport will open and be surrounded by fields with cows and the occasional pelican. Pelican? Pelican. Pelicans, you know, I mean, I'm not an expert on the pelican. You know where they don't hand, hang around the airport? I have never seen Especially a pelican. Especially not Western Sydney airport. No. Now, fly no. pelican, maybe. Yes, fly pelican, maybe. Now, I live by the sea and I still only see one, a pelican 
once a year, once or twice a year if I'm lucky. And you know what? Pelicans, they love hanging around the seaside. They don't like, and I love an airport. I love a runway. I love a terminal, as I'm sure you do. Pelicans don't. There are no plane spot in Pelicans. There's none. There's none. Not with that attitude. There's not. You said, and why would they want to hang around somewhere they could get run over as well? So that's ridiculous. Again, more smart-ass comments from these people who clearly aren't aviation believers like us. Yeah, so they, they, they don't have faith in the aviation gods and so may attract the wrath of the dread Enoch. Um, uh, now, Minister, Transport Minister Catherine King uh, uh, the other week uh, turned the first sod on the airport's business precinct. Um, and she has described the airport... Uh, as uh, 73% What a complete. nerdy thing to 73% say. 73% complete. 73% complete. Isn't that like three quarters? Now 73? Ridiculous. Go on, sorry. It's just, yeah, it's just shy of, just shy of three quarters. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, any any delays, she has uh, laid the blame at, at the feet of the previous New South Wales coalition oh, government. Of course, of course. Yep. As no, is uh, tradition. She's, she's a politician. Um, <laughs> and she is maintaining that the airport is on track to open in late 2026. She says, quote, I understand that the Minns government inv- inherited a bit of a mess here and having to really work their way through to make sure that that is investment ready so that private sector investment can be done. And that's why the draft master plan... Um, for for the Bradfield Aerotropolis, uh, coming out in February was so important and that work is being undertaken by the New South Wales government. She said, my job as the Federal Infrastructure Minister is to build the airport, but to work really closely with the New South Wales government to make sure we've got that enabling infrastructure in place and that work's underway. Uh, now, there is, there is one important note here, which is that, of course, at least for the first uh, couple of years, the fuel for the airport will be coming in on big dub- B-double trucks because there will be no pipeline when the airport opens. So it is important to get those roads built. Um, but, you know, we, we we don't want to be short-sighted here. No. Um, she's done some, some excellent skullduggery here. Because, obviously, firstly, she's um, not as she just blamed this on the libs. She's blamed this on the liberal state government and yes. then emphasised um, this is being picked up by the new Labour state government. So what she's done, she's immediately obviously gone for the obvious people. Let's dump on the opposition. But she's left it open so that if things do go wrong, this is primarily responsible of the state government and not her at all. So she sort of washed her hands of this in many ways. When it, this is a 50-50 federal state project, I seem to believe. It's a, it's a, it's a real uh, it's a real political it's a real political uh, I don't want to say masterstroke. No. Cuz it's not really a masterstroke. It's a real political stroke. It's a political stroke. Well, let's let's move on talking about um that could well be an argument to come, but let's talk about something the opposite of an argument. A deal has been reached. The firefighters strike is off, Jake. Tell us a bit more. You wrote the story. Oh, huh? why? I don't have to do all the work. I'm <laughs> said yes, all right. You're technically right. I did write the story. God, you're gonna have to work harder next week. What have you done? What have you done? All the bloody work here, right? So we've been talking about the um, um, the uh, firefighter strike, which is one of two potential strikes um, involving air services, which is kind of the body that oversees um, air traffic control and also oversees um, aviation firefighters. And the kind of the ongoing um, argument here is that this wasn't necessarily um, about money. This was, in fact, about that what they would accuse um, understaffing, and they said this understaffing um, would lead, would you know, lead to them becoming tired, which would therefore make things more dangerous for passengers. Um, it didn't look like we would get anywhere closer to a breakthrough because we had this, I don't want to use that word again, beautiful word, kerfuffle. We had this kerfuffle. Oh, not a stoush? A sta- oh, that's a very, oh, sorry, a stoush. A I love stoush? That. You know, I'd never heard the word stoush when I was in the UK. If someone said, oh, they'd had a stoush, I'd be like, what are you on about? That is such an Australian word. So is rot. I'm, I'm, surprised yes. that, I'm surprised that nowhere else in the world has the word it's rot. It's ridiculous It's rot. such a good word. It is a good word. It is a good word because it's such an Australian word. It means someone's on the take. There's a scam, a backhand well, that's going it's not, on. It's not even that there's a scam. It's that, like someone's taking unfair advantage. Yeah, and that's, um, which yeah. may be perfectly, it may be perfectly legal, but it's 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 you know against the spirit of the thing. Oh, it's the spirit of Australia because all about fair go, exactly. you know, fair exactly. dinkum, fair everything, and there can be nothing worse than not being fair to an Australian mate. Um, I do love Australia, by the way. If anyone from immigration is listening, um, so <laughs> you know, it's it's okay. You you are white and British. 
it, you're fine. You can They're say basically anything. They're processing the permanent residency at the moment. I'm on a. T- <laughs> this is on ice now. I mean, this is the. No, I can't. Anyway, that was about three tangents. Let's go back. Anyway, from from the rot back to the stoush. To the stoush. Back to the argument between air services and aviation firefighters. Um, and basically, uh, there was all of this kerfuffle about these apparent leaked documents that showed how at risk um, travellers were. And air services basically came back and said these documents weren't in any way leaked. And they never showed that. This was a kind of a worst case scenario planning document. It wasn't in any way a, a description of what was going on. Anyway, there was a lot of bad blood, a lot of rows. So it looked like this was going to be, we're going to be a long way away from a conclusion. And then on Thursday evening, I believe, just after we sent our newsletter, um, we got confirmation from both air services and and aviation firefighters that they have in fact reached an in principle agreement and they called off their strike that was going to happen on Monday. Um, now essentially the way these things work is the union agrees a deal um, with the bosses um, and then this deal is put to a vote um, by members but you know almost certainly this is going to be approved. Um, one of the extraordinary, well not extraordinary but one of the uh, intriguing things about this is we don't actually really know much of the details about this at all. We know that they've reached a deal um, Air services basically say this satisfies all their concerns over understaffing, but we don't know exactly what this deal is, um, how much more money they're going to get, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's um, it, the, the details have sort of been kept under wraps um, because air services um, was, was basically implying that all of this... Um, all of this uh, uh, talk of safety from the the firefighters union, they were sort of, it seemed that they were implying that this was all a fig leaf to um, to, to cover up the firefighters' actual aim, which was a, a 20% pay rise, which air services could not provide. Um, so it will be interesting to see if and when the details of the deal come out to find out, you know, what the firefighters have actually got um, and, you know, what what air services, uh, what ground air services has been prepared to seed. Um, on the subject of air services, just a quick note. Um, there was a lot of uh, kerfuffle, as we say, Adam, last year about uh, air services performance. Um, well, uh, uh, sort of quietly, you know, throughout the first few months of this year, uh, air services, air traffic and p- performance has been getting a fair bit better since the um, since since the travails of last year. Uh, in March 2024, um, ground delays and cancellations that were attributable to air services hit a 12-month low, just 4% of ground delays, 1% of cancellations, and its capacity constraints affected only 1.3% of flights for the month. Um, so air services uh, is getting quite a lot bit quite a lot better in the provision of air traffic control services. So its network reports would suggest. Um, and this basically comes um, after a lot of backlash from um, airlines and from various other people in the industry. Um, that when I think in 2022 and sort of the start in 2023, well, we had a lot of delays and cancellations. We still do, but um, we had a lot of trouble with reliability. And the airlines were effectively blaming air services and said, you know, a significant amount of this was due to them not having enough air traffic controllers, which meant that airspace has to be closed. If airspace has to be closed, this can sometimes lead to um, to delays. And they effectively said that air services lost too many people during COVID or too many people took early, early retirement and they didn't get enough people in to replace them. And air services said that's not quite fair. Um, because we actually do have enough air traffic controllers, but it often depends on, you know, different types of job descriptions, you know, different rosters, etc. Um, and that they they argue they always had enough people um, to meet the kind of minimum requirements. But nonetheless, it does seem that the new people that are coming in, and it takes a long time to train people up and qualify them and etc. It does it does seem that things are getting better and that post-COVID performance is, is starting to improve. Yeah, air services still staring down a potential strike action from air traffic controllers um, who who are saying that uh, who are saying that, that there's there's still understaffing issues and and this toxic work culture. Um, so we are keeping an eye on 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 that situation, and we are going to see what what civil air uh, members end up doing. Um, but in the air traffic control world, uh, there's there's been more bright spots lately. So. Um, well done to uh, the the hardworking people at Air Service. Okay, welcome back. So I do try my best to make sure that Jake does all the work. However, this week really has been a 
series of failures. Um, and I'm going to have to talk about another story that I've written, which is that Qantas um, are going to face competition on their route from Sydney to Santiago. Is it Santiago? Santiago. Santiago. Santiago, Santiago. Um, Santiago. Tomato, um, tomato. Yeah. Um, basically, um, at the moment, Qantas have, since 2022, been the early airline to fly from Sydney to Santiago. And they're now going to have um, competition from LATAM, um, the big Latin American airline, um, who are now going to fly from Sydney to Chile. They already fly from Melbourne to Santiago, and they do another kind of route via Auckland as well. Um, but when you drill in, when you look at the BITRA Department of Transport stats, um, you'll see that the kind of a load factor on the flights out of Sydney um, to Santiago, the Qantas ones are about 90%, which makes it one of the most successful international routes Qantas um, operates. So now um, from, I think it's October, from the 28th of October, they're going to have a lot more competition. And also those flights are also all going to be, the last time ones are all going to be on shiny new 7879 Dreamliners. Yeah, yeah, this, this is, is um, um, this is going to be a, a real boost for people who want to get from Australia to South America or vice versa. Because you know, aside from these services to Santiago, there aren't really many ways to get there other than you know connecting through the states. Mm. Um, so you know, my I. I I know that my brother uh, was in Mexico, which is which is Central America. But my brother went to Mexico, and, and he had to, to to sort of connect through the states to go to Mexico City. Um, and you know, people people who are wanting to go to South America. If they if they don't get the flight through Santiago, then they're going to have to go through uh, the USA. So this is a real um, boon for you know Australian South American traffic, and it and it sort of gives a bit more competition on on that in that space as well. Hopefully, bringing the airfares down. Yeah, um, it's kind of it, well, another intriguing thing about this is obviously LATAM used to operate this route um, before COVID. They're now restarting it. So what we are seeing is is almost like the last dregs of COVID and the last dregs of restrictions finally kind of working its way out of the system. Um, and like you say, that will massively improve um, connections from Australia to South America. Oh, God, I'm going to pick another story that I wrote, which is terrible. I can't, I can't, I can't read this out about Hobart Airport. Um, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to I'm going to make you do some bloody work here. Um, right, go on Jake. Pick a pick a story that you've written to talk about. All right. Well, before we get to Hobart, how Go about we on. get to Hobart a bit later? Go um, on, yeah. Let's talk about another airport. Let's talk about Newcastle Airport. Newcastle. Love Newcastle. You a fan of Newcastle? Uh, you don't love the Gold Coast. It's it's a it's a it's a lovely town. I've had I've had some good friends who've lived up in Newcastle, and I've I've been there a couple of times. So it's uh, it seems like it seems like a good like a good place to be. Mm. Um, Newcastle Airport. Uh, on the subject of airport infrastructure from earlier, as we may know, they're in the middle of a big uh, refurbishment of the international terminal and the international services. They're getting you know, they, they're, 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 their runways are being redone. Um, and Newcastle Airport is basically coming out and saying, once our international upgrades are complete, we could be looking at daily international flights, you know, daily flights to New Zealand. We could be seeing services to Singapore, um, two daily flights to Singapore, regular Pacific services. Um, other destinations could include places like Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok, Middle East airports such as Dubai or Doha connecting onto Europe, Pacific airports like Auckland or Nadi with their connections to US and Canada. Um so basically, this idea of uh, Newcastle could be could take advantage of of hub travel. Where- yeah. Because if you if you fly to Singapore, that kind of opens up the world. And in exactly. fact, actually, Auckland as well is a bit of a hub because you could then go on to New York as well. Um, so it does seem. Um, and it makes absolute sense because you have a huge population, probably millions of people in that Newcastle Hunter region um, that would obviously all choose, even if they had to pay slightly more, they would all choose to rather start off in Newcastle and, and, and start their international holiday than, than go down to Sydney. Yeah, because many passengers in the Hunter region at the moment are choosing to fly out of Sydney instead of Newcastle because Sydney has all the international connections. Um Newcastle Airport, about two hours drive north of Sydney, currently no international services. I believe it has had uh, a handful in the past. Um, But uh, Dr. Peter Koch, the CEO of uh, Newcastle Airport, has said... um, he told the Newcastle Herald, quote, We know the demand locally is good, but we don't have the airport facilities right now. He said, Getting airline flights is a very competitive business. It can take years to get a new route established, but once you do, gee, the the rewards are amazing. He's also said that aside from these international flights, um, there is enough demand right now for three daily services to Perth. 
um, which could be interesting, uh, particularly considering that um, bringing up one of our old friends, cons- particularly considering that Bonza is not currently flying to Perth. So if Newcastle uh, Airport uh, and Bonza play their cards right, we could see Bonza potentially flying from Newcastle Airport to Perth if they can get the connection in at Perth. It's really interesting because you you should be a consultant for Bonza because you've been you've been kind of like hinting at this like like when you want two friends to to get together and you're whispering in both of their ears you're like you're going up to Newcastle and being like have you seen what Bonza's wearing today or oh, looking very good and you go up to Bonza and be like absolute stud mix stud over there so what wanna... you're saying Adam go on. is that I'm being a wingman. <laughs> You can have that. You can have Thank that. You. you can have Thank that. You. That was great. And he's got, the, for those of you not watching me on YouTube, the smile on his face, he knows he's hit a 10 out of 10 there. He knows he nailed it. That was, that was wonderful. We should stop the show right there on that high note. But that is extraordinary. Thank you. Thank That's you. That's extraordinary. We're gonna, when we go down to the office in 10 minutes, we're going to have to go and tell everybody what you did and try and reenact it. That was brilliant. Um, getting back to the news, uh, this is... Uh, the, 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 this local business group, Business Hunter, uh, they've made a pre-budget submission calling on the New South Wales government to set up a $15 million aviation fund over three years to attract new flights. Newcastle Airport would match this dollar for dollar. Um, and they've made this point that New South Wales is the only state not offering funding to attract airlines. Um, because, you know, as Queensland has got its, like, its attracting aviation investment fund. You know, you've got um, aviation fund down in Victoria. You know, Perth, the Western Australian government is trying to attract more flights to Perth. But New New South Wales has kind of been resting on its laurels, isn't it? Because, yeah. it, because Sydney is the main, the yeah. biggest gateway into Australia. And so po- possibly the attitude is, well, we don't need to attract flights. We've got Australia's biggest airport. But some of these more these these more regional airports, like Newcastle, Newcastle could become, you know, a great sort of secondary or tertiary, once Western Sydney opens up, a great tertiary airport for Sydney, particularly if you get better rail connections and, 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 and you know, better road connections and better public transport connections, because right now, reaching Newcastle Airport is a little bit dire. Yeah, and it's a two-way thing, because obviously when you start off, you are able to, you know, turbocharge this route and have a more international travel, but the more international travel you get, the more that Newcastle itself could become an international destination. People actually, you know, from around the world coming to Newcastle or that being a stop for when people come and travel Australia, and that could absolutely turbocharge the area. There's no reason one day Newcastle couldn't be as great as a Goldie. Hey? I, I don't know if Newcastle would want that, Adam. <laughs> In my eyes, Newcastle would never be as great as a Goldie. I love the Goldie. On the subject uh, still of air, airport infrastructure, uh, we're returning to an old story, the Melbourne Airport Rail Link. Speaking of public transport to airports... Um, We've uh, the latest development in this uh, airport rail link in Melbourne is that uh, the this this former senior Queensland transport official has been sent in as a referee. Yeah, the uh, I don't know if you have you seen uh, Pulp Fiction, Adam. Yes, I've seen Pulp He's, Fiction. Uh, I, 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 I shouldn't have a silly question to ask, but mm. uh, but uh, Neil Scales, the former director general of the Queensland Department of Transport and Main Roads, has effectively become the Mister Wolf. Of the uh, the Melbourne Airport Rail Link, um, you know that the government is is sending in the wolf uh, to clean up this mess um, around around the rail link and and sort things out in this in this ever in this ever burning this 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 this, this ongoing stoush between Melbourne Airport and the Victorian state government. Uh, quick recap for those for those who are not in the know: um, there is a big kerfuffle and a stoush and all of these lovely words about the about the rail link. Primarily, uh, it's because the Victorian state government wants an elevated station at the airport, whereas Melbourne Airport wants an underground station. And they cannot agree. They are continually at loggerheads. This is... I'm, I'm making a... I was going to say, yeah, this I'm, is like... these. I'm doing these, emotion. Watch doing this emotion on YouTube. Here. This yeah, is watch brilliant. This on YouTube. If, if you are watching this on YouTube, then that's redundant. Anyway, they, they're, at the, they're at loggerheads and have, and have been butt, locking horns and bucking heads and, and, and all of these uh, lovely... <laughs> Locking horns, butting heads, all of these lovely metaphors about where and how this station should be built. And the federal government has, has sick, is sick to the back teeth of the whole thing. They've, because, had, a, they've had a gut full, they've had a yeah. gut full. And so, and so they're sending in the wolf, or the scales, as, as this case may be. <laughs> so effectively the adults, the adults can't work it out, so they're having to bring in teacher to sort this out. Exactly. Um, 
Right. Okay. Let's 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 do one more story. It's not the most exciting story, but we've been talking about it before. We're going to talk about Hobart Airport. Well, I'm going to be forced to talk about Hobart Airport. Um, Hobart Airport has become, and this is the angle I put on the story, one of Australia's first major airports to see its overall passenger numbers surpass um, pre-COVID 2019. And the backstory here. Or uh, pro COVID twenty nineteen, as I see. You oh God! Put here, Adam. Oh no! Oh dear! That slipped through, Burnett, didn't it? Oh, this is really bad. Phil and Alex aren't listening. I'll be in a world of trouble. Look, we're going to go and change this by the time this comes out. <laughs> that, to pro be clear, COVID, to be clear, that's really bad. We're to not clear, pro COVID. Hobart, Air- Hobart Airport was never pro COVID. Okay, pro- Hobart Airport, like all of us, hated COVID. I so reckon. So, if any lawyers from Hobart Airport are watching, we know that you did not like COVID. Well, just to come round, I reckon we can blame this on Sinead, who I said at the start of the show was an absolute nightmare. So let's throw Sinead under the bus. If, if, if any of the senior management are listening, that was a Sinead problem. That wasn't a my problem. In fact, I probably wrote, I probably wrote pre-COVID and she probably changed it to pro-COVID just because uh, Adam, she said Adam, let's not let's not slander Sinead on, on our show. <laughs> I, I, she, she, I, I hear she is uh, almost as terrifying as Enoch. Yes, yes. Um, anyway, anyway, let's gloss over that. Um, the backstory here is that we've seen a recovery of aviation, obviously, since COVID. But initially, the recovery from domestic was very, very strong. Um, and then what happened is the domestic recovery kind of stagnated a little bit. Um, due to a lot of factors initially that we didn't have enough capacity, we didn't have enough flights. And then when we did start to have enough capacity in flights, we've obviously got this cost of living crisis, inflation, etc., etc., etc. Um, But while domestic has struggled, international has done quite well. In a lot of airports now, international passenger numbers are actually surpassing uh, pro-COVID 2019. But obviously domestic is still the bulk of flying. So what what we could say, Adam, is anti-COVID, A-N-T-E, which also means before. So anti-COVID as opposed to to -COVID. Um, pro-COVID. anti-COVID, anti-pandemic. but anyway, so Hobart has effectively become the first, we believe, state capital airport to surpass 2019 numbers, except, as Jake pointed out on Friday evening, except Perth, um, which in January did have its best ever January. However, that was ne- that was kind of fueled by a boom in FIFO flights or FIFO flights and regional travel. So there's an element that Perth as a market is a little bit of an exception. Um, but- well, Perth is also, uh, I think Perth has just recently followed Melbourne in uh, its international numbers going above. Mm. Uh, at, at, at the, there's got to be, you know, antediluvian means before the flood, antipestilential. This is my vocabulary is very small. And well, it's if, if there's no word the antipestilential, I'm calling it. I'm 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 coining it now. Uh, Perth has also seen its um its its international figures go above antipestilential levels. Um, uh, and and Perth has been doing um you know quite a lot in conjunction with the with the WA state government to attract more international traffic into the airport as Australia's western gateway. Yes, which does make sense. And again, that was one of the reasons we had those direct flights that Qantas put on, because the idea is is that you go to get this flight if you're from the east of Australia and you have a weekend and you have a few days in Perth. So it does make absolute sense. Um, back to back to Hobart. It's good news. It's good uh, good news that their numbers are on the up because they are actually doubling the size of their terminal. They're putting a bit of money behind that. So arguably, if there's one airport that needs to get back to 2019 figures quickly, it was Hobart. But it seems to be job done. Yeah, um, good, good job, Hobart, and uh, you know, good job to to all of these airports that are um, punching above their antipestilential weight. On that note, on that note, on. I, there is one more you story do this that every I want to week, don't There's you? one more story that I want to touch up on that, that I want to that I want to touch on because on. it's 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 sort of a quirky little story that came through to us today. Uh, oh yes, I should have mentioned this. Yes, yeah, Skyports with, for some reason, a Z, um, is this uh, electric air taxi company that's looking to install uh, Verti ports in, in sort of private businesses. So basically the sales pitch is, um, you know, we can we can deploy this, this Verti port on top of your, your building, on top of your office building or, 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 or what have you, and, you know, we can fly these um, VTOL or STOL electric aircraft um, all around in, in air taxi services. Now, uh, Skyports has launched a new airline service subsidiary to operate these electric and hybrid aircraft. Um, they're calling it Wilbur Air. 
um, its aircraft will have uh, priority access to its vertiport to the Skyport's vertiport network uh, with a range of aircraft partners. The first partner is Electra Aero, which is a U.S.-based company, not to be confused with Electro Aero. Both of them are spelt with dots, so it's Electra Electra dot Aero and Electro dot Aero. I hate when they do their stupid rubbish. Oh, let's put a full stop in the middle of a word and and, and all that kind yeah, of two, nonsense. Yeah, I, I, two two companies which I'm pretty sure are unrelated. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the good people at Electra and or Electro dot Aero. But uh, Skyports has partnered with this company, Electra dot Aero, to, to get Australia's first 100 electric short takeoff and landing aircraft. Um, and these will, uh, you know, form the, the first aircraft in the Wilbur Air fleet. I, I got to say, I'm not, the name is not it's a bit rubbish, isn't it's it? It's not really selling. They're not it really does, selling me on the name. We we spoke about this earlier. It does sound like a kind of a kids' TV. Yeah, it's like or you know, Budgie the helicopter, Wilbur, and also I've got to say the picture of it as well. It does look a little bit like a kids' sort of. Yeah, you know, you've got you got um you got Budgie the helicopter. You got Pippa the Pippa the plane. What is it? Pippa the the plane. Just I'm I'm just looking at it. I'm just looking it up now. You know, Pippa. Yeah, Pippa, Pippa the single engine monoplane. Um, and I guess Wilbur the air taxi now. Um, so it's uh, it's the sort of aircraft that we'd want to go hanging out with. I get this flying kangaroo. Uh, Do you see what I did there? Yeah, so that's a maybe. whole brought the whole we, we've, show we've, it's, it's come full circle. But it has. Uh, look, I mean, uh, uh, good on Sky, good, good, good job, Skyports with a Z. Um, for, uh, for for getting on top of this, um, you know, advanced air mobility is becoming increasingly uh, a, a topic of, of, of consideration. All this talk about air taxis um, and eVTOL aircraft. You know, you've got AMSL Aero with its Vertia, which is going to be used for um, particularly by uh, Care Flight for for aeromedical services. Um, air taxis, electric aviation, they're becoming big, big watchwords in in the aviation industry at the moment. And so, um, if if Sky Ports can get Wilbur Air going, um, then that's a that's another solution for, for for getting around cities quickly. Yeah, and also well, the other thing we're seeing is that this is this is kind of inching from being something that's going to happen into the future to being things that are going to happen very soon. The technology is pretty much there now. Yeah, they've got this vision document from the uh, Australian Association for Uncrewed Systems, which is the peak body for AAM in Australia, um, predicting that the first of the AAM aircraft will be operational in the country by 2027. Um, potential uses things like air tourism, which you know. Uh, not, uh, That's just called tourism, isn't it? Yeah, well, uh, things you'd like, you know, helicopter joy flights, for example. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I Things see. you'd use like I a see. helicopter yeah, yeah, yeah. for nowadays. Um, mail, aeromedical services, low volume scheduled passenger transport, like, you know, air taxi services and um, airport transfers. Um, I mean, New Zealand, Air New Zealand is, is already investing in these um, electric uh, sort of short range aircraft to be u- to in a partnership with like the New Zealand Postal Service to to deliver mail mm. um, uh, in, in very, very soon into the future. So AAM is a space to be watching in Australia, definitely. And we will keep watching that. Can I wrap up the show? Are you gonna? You're gonna be. Are you gonna be? Is it gonna be a kerfuffle again? And because we do this every week, and I go, oh well. On that note, and when you go, oh, I just one more thing. Um. Well, okay. There is one more thing, and then I'll get out of your hair. Go on. Uh, do you like my Columbo impression? That's quite good, actually. Yeah, it's it's. I wasn't sure how to do a Columbo impression because I kept I kept thinking this is just the grandfather from the Princess Bride, but then I looked up the actor and it's the same guy. So I guess it was right all along. You never thought. No one listening to this thought they get a Columbo <laughs> impression at the end of this show, but you got one. Very niche. Um, on that note, we're going to wrap up the show. Jake, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Adam. And, um, oh, that messed up my voice. And uh, if, you, if you if you have heard from Benjamin Foster, do let us know. Otherwise, if you are interested in being a sales professional working for the aerospace industry, adam.thorne at mentormedia.com.au. Uh, and uh, just keep in mind, occupational hazards possibly being dragged up into the air vents by a pair of uh, filthy claws never to be seen again. Yeah, I mean, as long as they hit the target, we don't care. Anyway, we will be... <laughs> We will be back on the show the same time next week. For now, from us, goodbye. Remember to to bring your orb.